I am absolutely thrilled to be here today with you. It is a great honor to be at the inaugural uh, Women in Business Summit uh, today. And um, as Tony mentioned and Carolyn mentioned, we have an incredible audience, right? We have prospective students, we have current students, we have Darden alums, we have leaders from the Washington DC area, and we even have my sister and my college roommate here today. <laughs> So thank you for being here. So I hope my remarks today will have a little bit of something for everyone. So as you may have read in my bio, and then as Tony so eloquently described about my background, I have had an incredibly diverse business career. I have been in consulting. I have been in consumer products. I have been in life sciences. I have been in specialty retail. I have worked at startups. I have worked at private equity backed companies. I have worked for multi billion dollar publicly traded companies. I have bought companies and I've sold companies. I have lived in amazing cities. I've lived in New York City three times, London, San Francisco, and even Washington, D.C. And throughout it all, I have been a working mother of two children. So when Carolyn uh, and I spoke and we were talking about the summit, and she said, well, the theme is going to be the great reinvention. I thought, oh, I am really well equipped <laughs> to be able to talk to that. And But I want you to think about the great reinvention, not just the past two years. And it's not like the Great Depression. You know, it starts in 1929 and it ends in 1939. It didn't start in March of 2020 with the outbreak of the pandemic, and now it's not suddenly subsiding. On the contrary, if you are a woman in business, you are going to have to live in a perpetual state of reinvention. Now, that may sound scary to you, intimidating, uh, unsettling, but I promise you, if you can wrap your head around that, if you can think about reinvention as a positive, you will be able to accomplish goals that you never dreamed possible. You will take an ordinary business career and transform it into an extraordinary business career. Now at Darden, as many of you know, it practices the case study method. So today, I am your case study, a robust sample size of one. And so I'm going to take you through five chapters. And this is five of many reinventions that I have gone through over the years and how it has propelled me forward. And then hopefully at the end, I will leave you with some lessons learned. OK, so here are the five chapters that I'm going to take you through. The first, which Tony touched on, is Escape from New York. Founder's Dilemma, The Reluctant CEO, Curveball, and Virtual Leadership. Okay, chapter one, as Tony mentioned, I decided to escape from being a banker in New York City by applying to Darden. So I was in banking, I worked at a French Arab bank, putting that French degree to good use, and I was trading currencies. Now, don't get me wrong, it was fun. It was exciting, but it was not a long-term career. So I thought, okay, how am I going to transition from finance into marketing? I wanted to be a marketer. At least I thought I did. And so I thought, graduate business school, that's my ticket out. So I applied to Darden, and I got in. And the other reason I wanted to go to Darden is that both of my older sisters had also graduated from Darden. So I was just trying to keep up with them. So I got accepted, graduated from Darden. You can see this is a picture of me on graduation day with my two sisters. And, um, and it worked. I transitioned. I was successfully able to go from banking into branding. And so I landed my dream job with Kraft Foods in brand management. And I ended up marketing good season salad dressing and shake and bake. <laughs> So when I graduated from Darden, it was 26% women in my class. That was 1991. The 2023 class at Darden will graduate with 
40% women. So, big improvement, but we can do better, right? We'd love to be at parity or better at Darden with women. So, and I'm confident with days like today that we are going to get there. Okay, second chapter, we're gonna fast forward. It is 1999, and uh, if you were uh, around during those days, I know we have some young people here, it was the go-go days of the internet. E-commerce companies were starting, people were raising crazy amounts of money. You know, there was the e-toys and the web van and the pets.com that was going on. It was just a, a, a crazy point in time in business. And so I thought, I wanna start my own company. And I convinced my sister to leave her job after 12 years and to join me on this quest. So we founded a company, it was called Gold Violin, and we sold products for seniors. We wanted to be the William Sonoma, selling vision products and mobility products and hearing products and products if you had arthritis, but high quality, really designed, really highly designed, well-designed uh, products. And so we raised our initial seed capital. We shipped our first product. It was March of 2000. And then the next week, the NASDAQ crash. So what does that mean? Well, if you're a startup and you have seed capital and you're burning through it at a pretty fast clip, all of a sudden when there's no more access to money, you can't keep going. And so we're not ones to kind of, you know, roll over and just give up. So we're like, okay, we got to cut costs. We got to lay off all the high price talent. We're not going to pay each other anything, okay? And we're going to look for a lifeline. And we found that lifeline on live television. So when I went to Darden, we didn't do any cases about QVC. I, we didn't watch QVC growing up. I had never bought anything on QVC. And so when I heard about it, I realized, wow, this is this incredible channel of distribution, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 364 days a year, they are selling product on live TV. That's a gigantic product pipeline. And I thought, I, what? we've got product to sell, don't we? And so anyway, we got an introduction into QVC through a private equity firm that liked our business concept. They didn't invest, but they liked our concept. And so we presented our products to the buyer. This was one of our best-selling products. It's a soapy sole, in case you're wondering what it is. It helps you, your, enables you to scrub your feet if you have difficulty bending over. And so as part of this, if you have ever watched QVC, there's always one host and one guest, not two sisters. So I, we were going through media training and I said to my sister, Anne, I'm like, you have to go on air. Like, you have to be the, the spokesperson here. I said, you're so much more articulate than I am. You speak so much more slowly. You're a snappier dresser. And she said, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, perfect. You're gonna go on air. I'll be rooting for you behind the scenes. So we went through the media training. Closer we got to the air date, I could tell she was kind of getting nervous. And then she finally said to me, she said, I can't do it. I, I, I just can't do it. So she, she got cold feet and she goes, I can, you have to do it. So like, what do you do, right? Like it's your si older sister, you convinced her to leave this amazing job that she has. You're doing this startup, you're not paying her anything. And she's like, I'm not going on air. <laughs> and I said, so, you know, this was about company survival. I either did this, right, or we would go down in flames. That's what would happen. So, you know, I dug deep. You know, I pushed outside my comfort zone, and I walked onto that stage set, and I spent the next four years on live television saving our company. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it still remains. <laughs> okay, okay, we're gonna fast forward again. It is 2010 now, and I have joined a company called Healthy Directions. It is 
a company that sells doctor branded nutritional supplements direct to consumer. It's about a $150 million company based over here in Bethesda. So I joined as executive vice president of merchandising and regulatory affairs. And so my second year on the job, and one day I come into the office and the CEO and the CFO walk out the door. The company was in financial distress. They were at loggerheads with the private equity firm and they left. So the company was leaderless, it was rudderless, and it was in financial difficulty. I mean, it was, we were busting bank covenants. It was, it was ugly. So I went home that night and I told my husband about this situation. He's also a, uh, was a Darden grad. And uh, he urged me, he said, Connie, he said, you've got to throw your hat in the ring. You've got to raise your hand. You've got to grab the reins of that company. And I have to tell you, like, I was not feeling it. <laughs> Okay, number one, I thought the private equity guys, they're never going to select me. Number two, I wasn't really convinced that I could turn the company around. And number three, I had two young children at home, Anna and Luke. I had all kinds of reasons, okay, to stay safely on the sidelines. Private equity guys jump on the plane, come to Bethesda. They're going to meet with all the senior leaders individually. I thought, oh, what am I going to do? And I'm like, you can do this. You can do this. You can do this. Like talking to myself, like you can do this. Walked in the room with them. And I said, I can run this company. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, we don't even know you. <laughs> I was just like. And I, they may as well have said, we, we don't even see you, right? And I thought, oh, you know. So long story short, they made me president. And then they gave me what I thought was some impossible task. I had to stop the bleeding. I had to go in and rene renegotiate all the royalty contracts with the doctors, something that had never been done in the history of the company. Six months later, after, you know, taking on these tasks, they made me CEO of the company. My team and I, we turned that company around. We eventually sold that company to a large publicly traded company and that private equity firm exited their investment. It was a home run for them. Okay, fast forward again, 2016, I was recruited to be the CEO of a, another private equity-backed company. This was one of the largest private DNA testing companies in the world. And yes, we did provide the paternity tests for the <laughs> for paternity court and others. We did all the DNA sampling when the artist known as Prince passed away to figure out that whole estate. Fascinating life sciences business. So the only snag was that the company was based in Cincinnati. And I lived here in Arlington. So I became a commuter CEO. Monday morning, 7 a.m., I was at Reagan flying to Cincinnati. Thursday nights, I got back into Reagan 10 p.m. So gone three nights during the week, living in the Marriott. And my husband, who also had his own company, was home taking care of the kids during the week. And then Life throws you curveballs, right? And so it's 2018. I'm at my office in Ohio and I get a phone call and it's my husband's office. And they said, Connie, your husband's collapsed and he's on his way to the emergency room. And so this was the first of many unexplained seizures that my husband had. In the fall of 2018, he was diagnosed with stage two brain cancer. And at the time, the prognosis with treatment was, you know, 10 to 20 years. So shocking, yes, but, you know. And so I called the private equity firm and I said, I can't run this company anymore. I have to leave. I have to go home and be with my family. And I offered, I said, I'll stay in the CEO seat until you find my replacement. January 3rd, I get the phone call from the chairman of the board. She calls me and she says, Connie, we've got great news. We found your replacement and he's starting in February. 
I said, great, that's good news, really appreciate that. January 4th, my husband's diagnosis was changed to stage four, and that's a highly aggressive brain tumor called glioblastoma. One week later, he passed away. He's actually buried right over here in Arlington Cemetery. So in nine months, my life went from, you know, globe trotting, CEO, road warrior, to like grieving widow, unemployed caregiver, and sole parent to my 12 year old and 16 year old. And on top of that, my husband, he was a retired Navy commander. He had his own consulting firm as well, a Defense Department consulting firm. And overnight, I was responsible for this company, the employees, the government contracts, top secret security clearances. You know, I thought about running his company for about 10 seconds. <laughs> this company, this was his life. He loved all things Navy, right? He knew about government contracting. He knew about military program management. He loved schmoozing with admirals at the Pentagon. I didn't know about any of this stuff. We, we actually didn't get married till he was already out of the Navy. And so for me, I thought about it. And they always tell you when you lose somebody close to you, like the prevailing wisdom is don't make any important decisions the first year. I was like, a year, a year, I can't wait that long because he was, he was the rainmaker, right? He grew that business from nothing. Every day that he was not at the helm, that business, in my opinion, declined in value. So for me to reinvent myself, to transform myself into this military veteran Wonder Woman, it was not going to happen. You know, my superpower in business was strategy and branding and marketing and, and consumer facing businesses. It was a critical decision for me at this point because it was his baby, it was his incarnation, it was his avatar. And so I decided to sell it. And 11 months later, I sold that company to a Native American woman owned business. Okay, fast forward again. Okay, we're finally into the pandemic area. So June 2020, I've been hired as the president at Garnet Hill. And um, Garnet Hill is a 46-year-old brand founded in Franconia, New Hampshire, originally as a catalog company. And we sell women's apparel and product for the home, all uh, unique custom designs, prints and patterns and always using sustainable natural fibers. So if you think organic cotton or linen or cashmere, those are the types of uh, products that we sell today. And so when I was recruited, it was the height of COVID. So I never met anybody from the search firm in person. I never met my boss in person. I never met anybody on the interview panel in person. I never met any of my employees in person. I never visited the offices in Franconia, New Hampshire and in Exeter because they were closed due to COVID. So I was a virtual on-screen leader. Now my leadership style is, if my being up here today is any key to that, <laughs> is I like to jump in feet first. I like to understand the business. I like to roll up my sleeves, you know, get in the weeds, you know, figure out, you know, how are we going to create value at this organization? So my like tried and true leadership style was in lockdown. So how do you lead an organization through a screen? How do you motivate people to do their best work? How do you protect 
a brand? How do you protect your customers? How do you protect your employees during a global pandemic? And so for me, I had to, I had no choice. I had to reinvent my leadership style because there would be no in-person strategy sessions. There would be no in-person town hall meetings. There would be no focus groups with customers. There would be no trips to visit vendors. So I thought about it and I thought about it and I decided, okay, I am going to focus on the biggest, most important decisions that will ensure the legacy and longevity of Garnet Hill. That's where I'm going to focus. And then I'm going to let my leaders lead. This was in a time of, as everybody in this room knows, incredible volatility, um, incredible uncertainty. And I ultimately chose trust. I was going to trust my team. And you know something? It worked. The company has flourished. My team has flourished. And I have even flourished as a leader. Now, something else to consider, however, is that Garnet Hill is 85% women. 90% women in leadership roles. So that may have had something to do with it. <laughs> Samples, and I tell you, like that's five, uh, I could have given you a lot more, um, of reinvention, right? And how it's propelled me um, through my career. So what are, what are some learnings? Like what can I, what are some leave behinds uh, for you to think about? So the first one is prepare yourself now for perpetual reinvention. It truly is a path to growth. And it seems scary, might seem frightening and everything like that, but truly, if you could just Wrap your head around it. You will, you will achieve things that you will have really never thought possible. Push past your comfort zone. I, I can't tell you the number of times I have been afraid. I have been scared. I have been worried. I have been nervous. I've thought, I just want to crawl under the covers and go home. But set it aside, okay? And if you can push past, okay, push past your comfort zone, okay, wonderful things will happen. The next, hitch your wagon to those you admire and who believe in you. I have had sponsors and mentors throughout my career who have made a gigantic difference. And so it's really important to seek those people out and then hang on. I mean, I have my very first boss in consulting, you know, to this day is a very dear friend of mine. He's sat on boards of my company. He's helped me raise money. So seek out those people. And it's not a gigantic universe, but a handful of people. And, and they need to feel the same way about you. Recognize your value, and if not reciprocated, take it elsewhere. Do not be a corporate martyr. There are hundreds, there are thousands of organizations out there that will appreciate what you have to offer. So if you're not getting the fulfillment, the recognition, the reward where you are, take yourself somewhere else. You control the journey from an ordinary life to an extraordinary life, okay? It is in your hands, okay? You're gonna have choices all along your career, okay? You're gonna have choices, you're gonna have to make decisions, but own them. It is in your control. So, that's just some of the learning that I want to part. There's 
I have a lot of other, you know, uh, 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 free advice <laughs> that I'm constantly gi giving out as well. But uh, uh, th these are the takeaways for me. But I just uh, want to say, like, if you can, um, if somebody had interviewed me coming out of Darden, and they had said to me, they say, they said, Connie, you're going to leave here. And you're going to be an entrepreneur and you're going to start your own company. And you are going to go on and you're going to be CEO or president of four different organizations. You're going to sit on the board of a public company. You're going to touch thousands of lives through your corporate responsibility efforts. And at the age of 38, you're going to have a child. And at the age of 42, you're going to have another child. I would have laughed. I could not see that for myself. I could not dream that for myself. I just wanted to keep up with my sisters. <laughs> but if that insecure woman from 30 years ago standing in front of you today can accomplish what I have by letting go of my fears, pushing past my comfort zone, and embracing reinvention, so can you. Thank you.